hopefully you have a cup of coffee, so, and, and I don't put you to sleep, but, but the motivation for this talk is, is, is two things. One is uh, going back to graduate school, I really was interested in empirical models, and uh, it turns out that, that they're very, very data intensive, and it became very, very difficult to, to collect enough data sets uh, to do anything interesting with them. Uh, until about recently, I've generated a number of data sets over the past 10 years, and I've been lucky enough to get some data sets from people uh, to be able to, to put together what you're going to see today. So, so you know, it's, so it's a long-term interest of mine, but, but it's been difficult to get big enough data sets to do these kinds of modeling things. The other thing is that, that you see scale being used uh, in a lot of talks, actually, uh, when, when, when uh, for example, just what, a couple months ago when Brian Helmuth was here, he talked about the right scale of uh, environmental measurements that, would, uh, that he could use in his bioenergetic model muscles, okay? So scale is an, was an important consideration for him. For him. He, 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 he worried about where, you know, how frequently he needed to collect data to make some useful observations. And even the dean's candidate, uh, the other, the, uh, the first dean's candidate, I guess, a couple weeks ago, talked about the right scale to do geochemical measurements in estuaries. So, so a lot of people think about scale issues. Uh, a lot of people don't think about them. So I wanted to sort of uh, talk a bit about scale and how it affects empirical models and how it affects how you perceive uh, systems. Okay, so uh, up front I'm going to acknowledge a bunch of people, some students, Allison, Tyler, Nicole, and some colleagues, Mike, Roger, Janet, Glenn, Corey, Larry, um, uh, some funding agencies. Um, uh, and uh, uh, what I want to do first off is tell you what scale is. And it's not an easy thing to find, figure out. If you start to search for scale, you see lots and lots of things pop up. And you often get multiple contradictory meanings. Um, and uh, terms that are used either singly or together, things like grain, extent, lag, um, resolution, you see that a lot in, in fields like remote sensing, uh, cartographic ratio you see in geography, um, uh, all sorts of terms get thrown around. Um, in ecology, uh, uh, the main terms that are used for scale are um, uh, grain and extent, okay? And grain refers to uh, the size of a unit in, in, uh, of measurement. And extent uh, refers to uh, how far uh, 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 the size of the area that you're looking at uh, in terms of measurements. And most often, these units of scale are applied to spatial units. Okay, So this would be the size of the sampling unit. This would be the extent of the study area. But they can also be applied to time units. Uh, the time interval, uh, uh, I mean the size of, of the uh, time of sampling, the extent of your study. Um, sort of more neglected, and what I'm going to concentrate on is the interval or the spacing between samples. Okay, You don't see too many people talking about that. Uh, a lot of ecologists just use these first two terms and ignore this uh, interval thing completely. But I think it's very important, um, and so I'm going to focus on that. Um, to make it even more complicated, scale is applied in different ways. Um, uh, there is this, uh, people talk about the structural scale of a system. That's the pattern that gets created from the interaction between biotic and environmental variables. But they also talk about the process scale of a system, which refers to the uh, the, s the scale over which biotic and physical processes uh, act on a system. Um, and then there's sampling scale, which has to do with the characteristics of the sampling design, and the analysis scale, which is the characteristics of how you summarize the data and try to make inferences about it. Uh, this you have control over, this you don't, uh, and uh, very often uh, these two sets of scales don't match. Um, uh, so, so there are cases where the sampling and analysis scales are often defined arbitrarily, maybe because of practical reasons. There's a certain amount of money available, and so this is the best we can do. 
uh, but very often um, that scale is decided without thinking about the system that you're studying. Um, and it's possible that, that the sampling and analysis scale is, is, um, is mismatched to the structural or process scale. And that's a phenomenon known as scale arbitrariness. And it happens a lot. Um, the, um, uh, uh, we'll come back to that, hopefully. Um, anyway, uh, the, the two parts of scale and ecology that are paid attention to, grain and extent, um, uh, have been relatively well studied and their effects are pretty well known. As you go from a big sampling unit to a small sampling unit, so if, if you sample something over tens of meters as opposed to one meter as opposed to ten centimeters, the variance and the covariance of what you're um, uh, measuring increases. Okay, um, As you change your extent, Okay, from a small study area to a much larger study area, the variance and the covariance of what you're studying uh, also increases. So those, those have been looked at in, in a lot of detail, and people generally know what's going on with them. Um, uh, for example, um, uh, well, uh, uh, one thing that happens is that as you change these things, grain and extent, you also change the inferences that you can make about the data. For example, in the Hudson River, if you sample throughout the Hudson, you know, from, from uh, basically New York City up uh, to Albany, the whole tidal range in the Hudson, uh, salinity becomes the dominant uh, variable. Um, so, so everything seems to be driven by salinity. If you're doing, for example, a benthic study, you see a whole suite of organisms change over from ones that are essentially marine to ones that are essentially fresh water. And everything is salinity driven. If you sample in a small portion of the river, instead of seeing anything associated with salinity, grain size tends to dominate benthic uh, communities. Okay, So, so changing, uh, this is an example just of extent, but changing these two things does change the kinds of inferences that you can make about uh, what is controlling the uh, the community structure in these areas. Okay, so um, just to give you an outline of what I'm going to do, first of all, I'm going to have to introduce you, and Darcy's going to dread this, uh, to in statistical tools. Okay, there's a bunch of things that I want to use in this talk, um, uh, and I'm going to use them in a very convoluted way as we go along, and so I need to tell you something about them because um, I don't want to stop and explain each one as I come to it. So, so I'm going to tell you about them up front. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about the temporal, a temporal scale example, uh, which involves uh, a number of studies that looked at uh, fish and mobile uh, invertebrates in uh, Peconics, in Long Island Sound, and uh, Eastern Connecticut. Okay? And I want, to, I want to address questions like, can uh, the analysis scale be manipulated? Okay, I told you that scale affects inferences, and so can you actually manipulate the, the analysis scale to, to, um, uh, to examine patterns? Uh, are the commu fish communities in time kind of stationary, or are they just changing all the time? Uh, is there any pattern there? And um, uh, uh, does the pattern, is the pattern driven by local or regional types of factors? Okay. Um, and then I'm going to turn to a spatial scale example and talk about um, uh, how much community variation uh, is within or outside the spatial scale, the observation scale of the study. Okay? It turns out that uh, if you don't plan your sampling correctly, uh, a, a, a portion of the variation that you see in community structure is outside your observation scale. And you can't say anything about it. Okay, um, and then and then I'm going to look at how um, the explanatory variables you use, whether the scale of them has to be at the scale of the things that you're trying to describe, or whether they can be uh, different and still give you a lot of information about the system. Okay, so one plug for empirical models. Um, there was a very influential book by Burnham and Anderson published in 2012 called Model Selection and Multi-Model Inference. And this is sort, it sort of parallels uh, the way that I think about empirical models. Um, 
they say that, that um, information exists in data, okay? Uh, and uh, a model can be used to sort of put that information in a compact, understandable form. And what you want to do with the model is separate noise from information, okay? And that um, uh, using an empirical model, it, 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 it's interesting that it can be used to understand the system and not necessarily to make predictions, okay? And that's sort of the way that, that I like to use it. I, I want to sort of understand a biological structure, not necessarily uh, predict it, but understand what things are driving uh, or creating that structure. Okay. Um, and I got to do this. I'm sorry, but I have to do this. <laughs> I have to tell you about a bunch of different techniques. Um, and um, some of them are pretty well known. And I'm not even going to talk about cluster analysis, but I am going to talk about principal components analysis and variograms. These are used mainly with, with whatever response variables, the things that you're trying to describe, okay? Um, and um, um, they're fairly well known, and hopefully I can get through them very, very quickly. Um, the, the other techniques are, try, are, are being used to couple the, uh, the, the explanatory variables or look at the effect of the explanatory variables on the response variables, and they're regression techniques. And these are techniques that are probably not very well known. Um, um, to, to a lot of people here. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time trying to explain those. But the idea is that you've got some sort of uh, community. You, you go out and sample. You collect samples. You look at uh, what species you have. You count up how many individuals of each species you have. Um, so that in, in the case of trawl samples, you have species-specific catch per unit effort. In the case of benthic samples, you have um, catch a uh, number of in, uh, uh, species specific abundances uh, per unit area at the bottom. Uh, those are the things that you're trying to describe. And then you've got a bunch of explanatory variables such as temperature, time, depth, things of that sort, even so, uh, sonar backscatter uh, that you're going to use to try to explain the structure that you see. Um, uh, uh, most ecologists, when they look at these sort of multivariate types of uh, um, um, uh, structures transform the data. And, and, and uh, the transformation that I'm use, using is called the Hellinger transformation. It's the square root of the relative abundance. And so what it looks at is species composition in a sample, and the square root down weights abundant species, okay, so that they don't dominate the analysis, okay? So, so it's not a super complicated thing. And I'm going to compare two samples uh, in a very simple Euclidean way. Um, um, just the species-specific differences in, in abundance squared and summed up, okay? So it's a Euclidean distance measure, not very complicated. Um, and these elements that you can get by comparing two samples um, uh, form um, the basis for all the statistical techniques I'm going to use. So, so so everything is being done in, in exactly the same way and, and is comparable across uh, techniques. Um, so, so I'm going to start with a thing called multivariate regression trees. Um, and we're going to go through a bunch of techniques. And hopefully I can do this quickly because I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. Um, so imagine that you've got some sort of set of um, uh, uh, abundance data, okay, and you can think of this as a single species, you can think of it as multiple species, but it's, but it's something that you want to describe, and that you have a set of explanatory variables, and I'm only showing two here, but imagine that there are maybe 15 or 20 of them, um, uh, and it gets hard to visualize that, but, but that's the basic idea. So you want to be able to um, uh, explain that this uh, structure of these variables based on these explanatory variables. Now what multivariate regression trees does is it tries to take your space of explanatory variables and divide it up in such a way that your response variable is homogeneous within each of these regions, uh, but very different between regions. Okay, So it's a simple idea. You're just trying to partition things in a way that, that, um, um, that you have homogeneity within heterogeneity 
between. And, and, and once you do this, the predicted value is, is just the average of all of the samples inside that, that box, okay? Um, the the um, um, tree-based methods tend to do this by creating squares and rectangles. And they do it mostly with a, a thing called binary, uh, a recursive binary partitioning. What it does is it takes your space of explanatory variables and figures out the best place to divide it based on one of the explanatory variables, just one, not, not multiple ones. And then it uh, takes those two regions and figures out the best place to split it a second time. And the goal is to try, again, to try to make things, um, the, the things that you're trying to describe be as homogeneous as possible inside the box and as different as possible outside. And there's a whole bunch of uh, uh, details that I'm going to just skip over on how you actually do this and how you um, arrive at a, at a final uh, version. But the idea is, is again, to have this space divided up into rectangles. Uh, each re for each rectangle, you've got some predicted value that's the mean of all the samples within it. Um, and you can see that you can get some very complicated looking, uh, this, is, this is a three-dimensional representation of this, uh, th uh, very complicated set of predicted values for the thing that you're trying to, 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 to examine. Um, uh, and in fact, people have found that, that this regression tree approach can you know, effectively um, um, describe very complex things, interactions, um, um, nonlinearities, and so forth. Unfortunately, this sort of visual representation breaks down as soon as you go above two explanatory variables. But you can put the results into a tree like this, and that's where the sort of uh, name for regression tree comes from. It, no matter how many explanatory variables, you can always look at this and see the, the, the binary partitioning that's going on and what variable, what explanatory variable is used to do that, okay? Um, all right, so um, I got through that and nobody got up and left, so that's a good sign. Um, uh, principal components analysis. So now you've got, um, um, if you had only three species in your community, you could, you could have an axis for each species, plot the abundances as a point in that three-dimensional space, and then look to see how your community changed, uh, what the structure of your community was. Unfortunately, the data sets that I'm looking at have anywhere from 25 to 110 species, and looking at something in 110-dimensional space is not possible. Um, and so um, uh, you have to figure out a way of uh, you lose a little information, uh, at, but try to have some way of interpreting that kind of uh, pattern. And, and that's what principal components analysis tries to do. It takes advantage of the fact that um, uh, uh, ecological data sets, species are not independent of one another, uh, and they tend to co-vary. And so this large dimensional space is elongated in some directions. And it's compressed in other directions. Uh, and so it's possible at times to just put a simple plane through that space, project all the points onto it, and see a large amount of the variation that's present in the data. Okay, so, so what you're after is a low dimensional representation of a very complex system. And that's what principal components analysis tries to do. Um, here's an example of one of the data sets that you'll see a little bit later on. Each of these points represents a sample. Uh, it's, it's all been uh, projected down to two dimensions um, and uh, points that are close to one another like these two have very similar uh, community structure. Points like this and this have very different ones. Uh, and then on top of that, uh, species, individual species are projected um, and these arrows point in the direction of increase of particular species. So this one species, Tharyx I think is a polychaete. Um, uh, increases uh, in this direction, okay, the, the, uh, the origin is the mean, the low abundances are, are in that direction, high abundances are in the direction of the arrow, so these samples would be expected to have low abundances of this species, uh, these would be expected to have average abundances, these would be expected to have high abundances, okay? So, so, so it's a nice representation 
Uh, the trick is that this has to represent uh, to work has to be a large proportion of the total variance. Otherwise, looking at it in two dimensions doesn't make any sense. Um, um, okay, one more. Two no, a few more techniques. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, redundancy analysis. If you take and do a regression of your data against the environmental variables, uh, and then do a principal components analysis on those results, you get what's called redundancy analysis. And so you add a third level onto this diagram. That level represents uh, explanatory variables. So for example, in this diagram, percent sand is an explanatory variable. Uh, it increases in this direction. Um, the de the uh, depth of the apparent RPD, the redox potential discontinuity in the samples, increases in this direction. And those are continuous variables. You can also have um, categorical variables that represent different bottom types. And they can uh, enter into the, uh, into the regression as well. So you see these A, D, C. They, those represent uh, bottom types that were defined by sonar. So you can, you can put a regression embedded into this principal components analysis and start to see uh, uh, some more detailed structure about uh, the system. Um, Okay, this is almost the last tool. Um, uh, to get space and time into the analysis, um, um, you have to have uh, a way of relating differences between samples to, uh, to either uh, spatial uh, uh, distances or time intervals, okay? And that's what a variogram does. Uh, again, we're, we're measuring differences between samples in the same way. This is the species-specific differences in, in abundance uh, summed up over all the species, squared and summed up over all the species. And this gets plotted against either distance or time interval on the x-axis. And so if you do that uh, over all pairs of points, you get something that looks like this that's hard to interpret. Okay, but, but what the, this point represents is it represents the difference between two samples that were separated by a certain distance or time interval. Uh, and this point represents the difference between two samples that were uh, separated by a larger either distance or time interval. Um, uh, the reason why this looks crazy is that um, when you have, for example, 100 different samples, you have almost 5,000 pairs of points that you can create from that, okay? So, so it looks like a cloud, uh, and it's really hard to interpret. Uh, but what you can do is, is start to divide this up into uh, bins and average things within bi uh, distance or time interval bins. And so this is an example. Uh, you've got six points here. Um, you can measure the, the geographic distance between these points. Um, you can bin them by distance. Okay, so these are eight different distance classes. Figure out which ones fall into each distance class, uh, and then take each individual measurement of, of ecological dis the difference and, and average it over all the samples in that, in that geographic range. When you do that for, for these kinds of samples, you get actually something that looks very much simpler. Um, so this has uh, been divided up into um, it looks like, let's see, uh, 100 or 125 meter uh, distances, uh, uh, distance categories. And so the, the average variance with distance looks like this. This dashed line is the uh, overall variance if you ignore distances. Um, and one of the things that you could see here, well, there's a few things you could see here. First of all, it says that, that samples that were collected close to one another look a lot alike, okay? They have very little difference. Um, uh, samples that were collected far away from one another, okay, so this might be two kilometers apart, are, are much, have much greater differences. Um, uh, and um, um, people have, give, this, is, this comes right out of um, GIS, uh, geographic information systems um, uh, analyses. And uh, p uh, a lot of this actually was developed by um, uh, South African mining engineers. And so the terms that they gave for, for various uh, 
uh, important structures in this uh, tend to tend to make some sense to geologists. So, so they talk about nuggets. Okay, the nugget is the uh, the uh, variance that you get at zero distance. Okay, and that re represents very very small scale spatial variation. Um, so, so that um, uh, uh, perhaps even below the sample, uh, sampling interval of, of your study. Um, if, if this variogram levels off, that asymptote is called a sill, uh, and um, the difference between the sill and the nugget, the partial sill, is primarily due to environmental differences. Um, okay, so one, uh, one other thing that you could do with a variogram is you could take the total variation and uh, use this redundancy analysis to divide it up into explained variance uh, and residual variance. And so you can actually look at how the things that you can explain vary with distance and the things you can't explain vary with distance. Okay, so finally, I can get to some studies here. Um, uh, the first set of things uh, has to do with trawl surveys that were done in, uh, in, in this region. There are four uh, data sets. Uh, one was from Long Island Sound. It was collected by uh, Connecticut Department of uh, Energy and Environmental Protection. Uh, a second data set was from Peconic Bays. And then um, uh, the other two data sets were collected by the Millstone Environmental Laboratory. So they're, they're data sets associated with the uh, Millstone nu Nuclear Power Plant. Um, these two data sets, Long Island Sound and Peconic Bays, uh, the, uh, the sampling is done randomly throughout the system. Uh, these two studies, uh, I mean, these two data sets, they're at the same location. Um, but the, uh, this Niantic River and Jordan Cove stations are not very highly correlated to one another. So I feel like I can include both of them. I did throw away a data set that was correlated. Um, so the, um, uh, these studies are very extensive. They represent um, anywhere from, um, from, I guess, let's see, 1984, so that's, no, 87, that's uh, 25 years to 40 years long. Uh, every year they collect a lot of samples. Um, uh, and, and for example, this Peconic Bay survey uh, represents about 9,500 trawl samples. So these are all trawl samples that are conducted um, um, uh, over the course of a year and, and they're very extensive long-term data sets. Um, just some characteristics, but in any event, I just wanted to make, show you that this represents anywhere from 41 to 110 different species that have been collected. And again, what we're trying to do is, is trying to um, explain uh, uh, transformed species catch per unit effort using a variety of different environmental uh, or explanatory variables. Um, if you just do a variogram with the data, again, you've got 9,500. And we're going to just concentrate on Peconic Bays for a while. Um, the Peconic Bays survey had 9,500 trawl samples. That's, that represents four and a half, 45 million pairs of, station, of samples that you could compare. Um, you can't visualize anything. If you plot it, the only thing you start to see uh, is holes where they didn't collect in the wintertime. And so, and so uh, those show up as holes, but that's about all you can see in that. If you start to average, though, you start to see structure. And I, and I apologize that the, uh, the scales on these plots are different, but this dashed line goes through the total variance and all of them at the same level, and this scale is a little bit different. But, but you can see two things that are kind of interesting. One is that if you start uh, averaging on a weekly basis, um, uh, you see very, very strong seasonal patterns. Uh, but when you, when you average on a monthly basis, the, 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 the amplitude of the patterns decreases. It decreases more when you go to seasonal averaging, and it disappears. That, that seasonal pattern disappears completely when you average on an annual basis. So it's kind of neat. You can, you can kind of figure out how you're going to, the scale at which you're going to analyze these things and emphasize or de emphasize certain parts of, uh, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the change in the system. Uh, one of the things that I didn't know was going to happen, but the, um, this annual pattern, you could see it in, in all of these data sets. It doesn't uh, magically appear. If you stare at this long enough, 
you can see that everything is trending upward in, in these variograms. Um, so this is that annual pattern. Uh, um, a couple of things to note, again, uh, uh, samples that were collected a year apart uh, are similar to one another. Samples that were that they're more similar to one another than samples collected five years apart, uh, ten years apart, and so forth. Uh, so, so, the, so there is some sort of interannual relationship in in the data. Uh, but what is kind of, um, I, at least I found kind of striking, is that uh, as the time interval gets larger, the samples get more and more different. There's no uh, return, no periodicity in this data, maybe a little bit here in this wiggle, but you don't see it going up and down again like the seasonal structure. So, so the, the fish populations, the mobile invertebrate populations, just seem to be getting gradually different as you start to look at them at, at longer intervals of time. And that's an example of a non-stationary type of, of, of system. Um, it, it doesn't hit a sill, it, it just keeps getting different over time. Um, if we go, and this is the reason why I wanted to tell you about the techniques, if you go, because I'm going to start bouncing around, if you look at uh, the, the Peconic Bayes data set using multivariate regression trees, uh, you get what looks like four periods of time uh, that are important uh, where, where, the, where the, the, um, uh, the data set seems to group into four distinct periods of time. Um, um, there's a, a major split at uh, 1999 to 2000, and then there are some secondary splits. Uh, so you wind up with uh, 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 this 19, less than 1999 set splitting again at 1989-90, and then another split for 2008-2009. So it looks like there are four different um, assemblages in, in this data set that have different species characteristics. Uh, here's the, the, uh, the principal components analysis of that data set. Again, you know, um, uh, sam uh, years that are close together mean that the, the species composition is, is similar. Uh, years that are different, like 1988, 2008, mean that they're quite different from one another. And these arrows point in the direction of increases in, uh, uh, in abundance of various species. So, for example, scup would be kind of uh, low in abundance in these years, high in abundance in these years. And just to show you that that is actually what happens, here is scup, it's increasing in this direction. Uh, anchovy is increasing from bottom to top, here's anchovy, and these circles represent abundances of each of the species. Um, and winter flounder uh, looks like it decreases from the fourth quadrant to the second quadrant, if you look at the, at the, at the plot here, and that's what it's doing. Um, when you actually plot the values. Um, if you overlay this four group um, uh, multivariate regression tree uh, result on the principal components analysis, you can see that the set of points don't overlap at all. So they're very distinctly different. Those assemblages in those years are very distinctly different from one another. And in addition, if you, if you start to interpret this, uh, going from the late, from the 1990s to the 2000s, you can see that scup is increasing, small, summer flounder is increasing, smallmouth flounder is increasing, and um, uh, winter flounder, windowpane flounder, horseshoe crab, and lady crab are all decreasing as you shift from this group of years to this group. Um, if you do the redundancy analysis, now remember this is this couples uh, regression with explanatory variables. Uh, with the data set. Um, uh, I, I tried out a lot of different explanatory variables, including you know, temperature and uh, local temperature and salinity, dissolved oxygen, uh, secchi depth, and then also added a couple of climate indicators, winter, uh, NAO, uh, uh, and AMO. And, and some of these measures were lagged by zero one and two years, inclu including temperature. That's because it takes time for species to respond to changes in, in the environment. And a lot of people have done, done the analysis this way. Um, it turns out, though, when you, when you look at this, the, uh, the only four variables seem to explain community variation to any degree. Uh, three of them had to do with these regional climate indices, okay? 
and one of them with local chlorophyll concentration. And the local chlorophyll concentration only represented about 4% of the variance um, out of 52% that was explained. So, so um, it looks like, at least from this data set, that rather having uh, local temperatures, um, uh, the data look better explained by regional indicators uh, uh, of climate. Okay. Um, just to show you that this, this redundancy analysis does predict things, um, these are uh, six plots in time, so it goes from 1987 to 2012, uh, and the points are observed values, the lines are predicted values from, from the, the analysis. And you can see lots of different patterns all being explained by the same four uh, explanatory variables. Anchovies start high. get. Uh, become less abundant and then increase in abundance uh, later on. Horseshoe crabs decline, winter flounder declines, uh, lady crab sort of stays constant and then drops down. Uh, weak fish increases right around 2000. Um, and uh, Sorry, that's scum. And weak fish uh, also has a, a pattern where it seems to be low and then increases after about 2000. So, so the model is actually doing an okay job of describing um, uh, variation in time. If we take the, the variogram that we generated, which was this one, that seemed to show this non-stationary behavior, and divide it up into um, explained and unexplained variation, an interesting thing happens. Uh, the explained variation are these red points. Um, they seem to increase, okay, and kind of parallel the total variance, uh, su suggesting that the, the measures that we use to explain this pattern uh, is doing, are doing a pretty good job, okay? The, the, they're explaining this non-stationary pattern pretty well. The unexplained variance is flat, doesn't have any uh, slope to it, um, and, and it does have some wiggle, which I don't understand, but, but it doesn't show that sort of non-stationary behavior in time. So it's suggesting that, that these explanatory variables really are capturing the, the temporal dependence in, in the faunal data. Um, okay, um, if you look at this, the regression trees across all of the data sets, you start to see where transition occur, uh, transitions occur. And, and they're represented here with, with these red arrows. Um, you have to stare at it for a while, but if you do that, you find out that, that for example, all of the four data sets uh, had a community shift at about 1998 to 2000. Three of the four seemed to change from about 1990 to 1992, and three of the four seemed to have a shift at 2008 to 2010. Not quite sure about Long Island Sound. There was a year of missing data there, so I'm not sure what would have happened had we had that data set. Uh, so there seems to be some sort of regional pattern that, that the communities are shifting um, uh, throughout the region and not just in one of the systems. Um, when we do redundancy analysis for all the data sets, you start with a lot of variables. All of them that get chosen by the, uh, as explanatory variables are related to, all but one, related to uh, these climate indices. Only chlorophyll comes up in one of the data sets. And the data set, the, uh, the uh, redundancy analysis explains anywhere from 22 to 52% of the community variation. So just to summarize the, the, the trawl survey data, the time series were all non-stationary. They just kept getting more, the communities kept getting more and more different over, and over time. Um, the, the shifts seem to occur at approximately decadal intervals. They seem to correspond in time across surveys, uh, suggesting a region-wide pattern. And um, uh, for some reason, uh, by averaging, I think that I've masked out the effect of local temperature and salinity, and so and so this is being dominated by by regional uh, patterns. Uh, very interestingly, at 1999, um, the lobster population declined in Connecticut uh, and in New York and Long Island Sound, so it crashed. Um, the proximate cause for that was, uh, and Bob Wilson showed this r really beautifully, that there was this fall overturn that brought uh, warm water down to the bottom. Um, lobsters are cold water species. That may be combined with uh, lobster disease. Um, uh, probably 
uh, knocked out lobsters at this 1999-2000 boundary. But the population has never recovered. The fishery has never recovered. And there's no explanation that I've ever seen about why it hasn't recovered. And so here's an explanation, maybe, that what's happened is that the whole community has shifted. Not just lobsters, but a lot of other species. Uh, between 1990s and 2000, not only lobsters declined, but window pane flounder, winter flounder, little skate declined, and some species actually increased. Okay, so, so this kind of change seems to have taken place at the same time in the Peconics, in, in, in the area in eastern Connecticut and off of Millstone, and so it's suggesting that um, even though the, the, the die-off of lobsters in 1999 was, was temperature and maybe disease related. The fact that it hasn't recovered has to do with the fact that uh, uh, perhaps that the whole system has changed and it, it d doesn't have to do with any local Long Island Sound type of, of, of uh, factor. Okay, um, boy, this is going to be hard, but I'm going to try it. <laughs> uh, I'm going to talk about spatial structure in, in benthic communities. There are six data sets here. Um, uh, that we looked at. Two were kindly donated by Dave Strayer up in the freshwater po portion of uh, the Hudson. Uh, two it were, were mesohaline uh, in Harvestraw Bay and, and Tapatsy. So these were spatial uh, sampling, uh, benthic communities. Uh, and two were in the Peconics, east, one east of Robbins Island, one east of Shelter Island. Um, uh, there were anywhere from 44 to 100 uh, grab samples, and in addition to, to uh, data collected about grain size, there was also uh, information about uh, provided from, from uh, sonar surveys, and primarily Roger Flood collecting sonar data uh, to try to describe uh, bottom. Um, the, the data consists of a variety of different invertebrate species, amphipods, crabs, uh, polychaetes, and so forth. Um, it, it, it involved anywhere from 25 to almost 100 different species. And again, the idea was to try to relate species abundance patterns to some um, uh, explanatory variables. Uh, this is an example. We're going to focus on Shelter Island. Um, here's Roger's uh, side scan sonar survey. Um, he went back and forth, north and south, a lot of times, mapping the bottom. Um, and then our interpretation of this backscatter map is shown here. There were seven different um, bottom types we think were present, although it, it does turn out that, that uh, C, E, and G, these three, um, had no different differences in community structure and were kind of merged together. Um, a little bit more about the, the surveys that were done with grab samples. Uh, we also took pictures of the bottom and tried to characterize cover in the bottom. Uh, and use those as variables um, uh, in, to explain uh, community structure. Uh, here is the variogram. Uh, uh, unlike the temporal, the time series examples, this variogram goes up and levels off. Uh, and so there's distinct evidence of, of spatial relationships up to uh, about half a me, uh, kilometer distances. And then after about a, a half a kilometer distance, it looks like uh, things stabilize and, and pairs of samples that are more than a half a kilometer apart have no relationship to one another. They're completely um, uh, not correlated to one another. Um, the the uh, variance at zero distance turns out to be pretty large, actually. Okay, So, so this is um, the, the way to interpret this is if you extend this down to zero distance, this is local variation that occurs at at scales that are finer than you've measured, been able to measure. So you can't explain it with your environmental data. Okay, so, so it's happening maybe at the scale of organisms uh, uh, that are on the bottom. Uh, but it's there, uh, at, but it's below your observation scale. Um, there's a sill in this case, so it flattens out. And um, we're going to relate the size of this to the size of this sill in, in a minute. Uh, if you do redundancy analysis, it turns out that uh, we can explain about 45% of the community variation. Uh, most of the, expo uh, the explanatory power is in uh, bottom type. Um, so these different bottom types seem to explain differences in community structure. Uh, and then percent sand secondarily, and then a few other um, 
uh, smaller uh, um, explanatory variables uh, uh, played a role. Okay, um, if we do the variogram and couple it with redundancy analysis, this is the original variogram. It goes up and levels off. Um, the explained variance goes up and levels off and parallels it, so it looks like we're explaining the spatial dependence in the faunal data pretty well. And then the unexplained variance uh, is kind of flat after this first class, so, so it shows no real pattern. So we've removed the, the spatial pattern in the data, at least uh, to the extent that, this, uh, that the, uh, the, the, the variables ex uh, explain uh, the pattern. Um, Going back to this nugget, if you, um, again, you know, this is very small scale spatial uh, uh, changes in, in, in community structure and um, at, at a scale that's below your ability to measure it with, with the survey, okay? So, so uh, it's residual variation uh, and um, uh, you don't have environmental variables that can actually um, remove this variation. Uh, the part above the nugget in the residual can be explained and, and just wasn't explained by, by the, the regression analysis. Okay, so the idea here is that if this part is below the observation scale, why not take it out of the analysis and say, okay, you know, w the way that I've designed the survey, I can't explain this vari variation, so just leave it out and, and, and interpret the that the model on the basis of this removed. When you do that, it kind of the results turn out to be kind of interesting. The original redundancy analysis, we were able to explain 45% of the variance, um, and we couldn't explain 55%. When we remove this uh, small scale variation, we're explaining 71% of the variance. So we went from a respectable but not spectacular model to a really better model in the end by taking out what we know we can't explain. Um, even a little bit more so, here's a little bit of, of Roger's um, uh, sonar survey for Haverstraw Bay and you can see, uh, this is backscatter, you can see two bottom types here and here that have different backscatter properties and when we were looking at spatial uh, relationships we used all the pairs of, of sampling stations to do that but we can subdivide them by uh, stations that are within the same bottom type and stations that are, uh, pairs of stations that are between bottom types. And when you do that, um, you find out that we still can explain the between province, between bottom type variation, but we have a harder time explaining actually the within, the small, the, uh, the variation within bottom, uh, the same bottom type. So we go from uh, down to only about 22% of the variance can be explained uh, between uh, uh, community structure between pairs of stations that are in the same bottom type. So we're doing a poor job uh, within but not necessarily between. Uh, again, we did analysis of all of the, the six data sets and provinces and either percent sand or percent mud come up as the most important variables we can explain about 42 to 51 percent of the variance. Um, uh, when we look at the nugget, this, this small scale variation, that ranges from about 36 to 57 percent of the total variance. 57 percent is really high. Um, um, it probably, and, and I'm not ready to, to really say for sure, probably has to do with how dense the sampling is. So if you plot these points against their sample density, uh, you get a relationship that, that seems to be significant. Most benthic s surveys are done at this scale, one to two stations per square kilometer. Um, this is very unusual. Uh, this is spacing of about 225 meters apart. If you wanted to break, bring this down even further, you've got to go way out here um, and maybe to uh, spacing that's less than 100 meters to be able to to bring down the unexplained small-scale variance. Um, I'm not sure I buy this yet, but, but th it does look like something is, 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 is going on here. Um, if we take the non-spatial uh, explained variance um, and remove that nugget, it looks like we're doing much better in explaining 
uh, both the total variation in community structure uh, and the total variation between provinces, and we're really only falling uh, down uh, in some of the sample sets at, at looking at uh, within a bottom type at what kind of change in community structure we have at, within a bottom type. Um, so to summarize the benthic data sets, uh, we had this uh, small scale variability that represented 36 to 50 percent, 7 percent of the total. Um, that variation is due to probably biotic interactions at very small spatial scales. Uh, and maybe to some small scale environmental variation of things that we measured and things that we didn't measure. Um, but I'll bet anything that it has to do with, with uh, really small scale biotic interactions. Uh, we would have to get the sampling intervals less than 100 meters or so to begin quantifying that. That's bad news for benthic ecologists in general. Um, uh, uh, it means that you have to do very, very detailed sampling uh, to be able to start to see that small scale variation. But it is somewhat consistent. There have been a number of studies that have looked at single species, um, pool taxonomic groups like polychaetes uh, that have found roughly the same sort of thing. Um, but this is the first time I think that people have shown it for communities. Um, on the other hand, if you do sonar surveys and then you interpret those surveys in terms of different bottom types, uh, and then use that as a basis for redundancy analysis plus a few other commonly collected variables like grain size, water depth, percent cover. Uh, you actually do a very, very good job at describing community structure uh, between these different bottom types. And that's really good news for managers. Okay, So the other end of the extreme is that you don't have to do really, really fine scale sampling to be able to manage areas you can use the sonar plus a few other variables to start to talk about uh, different communities found in different types of bottom. Uh, and, and again, a number of people have suggested that these, these sort of seascape scale predictors that, that tell you something about different bottom types, uh, those, those probably integrate a variety of processes that it's not clear what they are, but they probably do uh, integrate them. And, and the challenge is to figure out what, what those processes are. Um, just one more slide and I'm done. I, am, I pretty much did it, right? Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, 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 sampling and analysis intervals are pretty underappreciated, how they affect things. But they do control um, uh, uh, inference. And if you change these intervals, you either unintentionally or maybe intentionally affect inferences in your data. Um, the, the explanatory variables, the scale of those that you use, don't have to match the response variables, the things that you're trying to describe. They can be at different scales. You have to be careful about choosing them. They don't even have to be from the same location. But, but the challenge is to figure out what they are and how to use them. Um, um, and and it's, right now, it's still trial and uh, 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 try them out and see what happens and, 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 and then refine things from there. But, but uh, they don't have to be the same scale. And then uh, taking, and, and, and I appreciate your sitting through this, taking all these multivariate tools and overlaying them and looking at them, um, those things um, can lead to insights into complex biotic environmental relationships. So, so I appreciate your attention, and I think I'm going to stop right there. Are you talking about um, uh, in time? Yeah. Uh, so those were fish populations, mobile invertebrates. Yeah. And it looks to me like some sort of large scale uh, climate associated changes have taken place. Mm -hmm. uh, and what's striking to me is all the data sets don't show return. So there's no periodicity to it. Um, they don't show that, that the change is leveling off and it's gotten to its maximum value. As the further apart you go in time, the more different the communities look. And that's, that's kind of discouraging, actually. Interesting. Yeah, go ahead. First, I'd like to thank you for letting me understand Allison's. <laughs> Glenn was a reader, too. <laughs> I finally understand where that word kernel comes from. Um, 
but I had nuggets. a nuggets. 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 Nuggets, sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Like the stone. It's like, uh, I wanted to ask about, I didn't hear part about why lobsters have never recovered. It's very interesting. But if you look a decade earlier, you have a similar shift in structure. You yeah. had a big increase in lobster abundance. Yeah. That lasted for that. Yeah. And then also looks like it. So that end might actually be interpreted as a shift as well. That was like 1990, 92, <laughs> somewhere yeah, in there. 99, 90, yeah. Which I think was also when you had a big shift in some of the. Uh, yeah, I hadn't thought about that. Things. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Like that, but Anybody else? Yeah, Nick? I'm not sure about this, but um, for example, the Potomac uh, fish population. <laughs> there's a change and you ascribe it maybe to a change in climate but could it be something entirely different like uh, disease oh absolutely and, and th I think that the climate indicators are just indices and they're reflecting maybe some physical or biotic changes that have taken place somewhere in the system I mean it could be disease it could be uh, change in, pre in, in, in important predators um, it could be um, a lot of different things. So I'm not saying that these are what is directly changing the system. They're probably just proxies for other things. But are, and, and are there patterns that, that are typical of climate versus disease? And can you go that far? I don't know that we have time series for diseases right. that, that are at this level. Well, not necessarily disease, but I mean any other uh, uh, factor that of a yeah, I think that, that it would be worthwhile to go back, and Mike and I have talked about this, go back and, and bring in some predators as explanatory variables, for example, and put in what summer flounder were doing or something else that might have been affecting some of the fish populations. Yeah, Bass? Bob, with the time series, uh, I, I wonder if there were consideration of life history traits, in particular generation time or... or needed to get into the survey versus not, not really only to the extent that that some of the variables I lagged by one in two years uh, yeah. just to see if they would come up important because it sometimes takes several years for a species to respond to an environmental change but also to grow into the sampling gear um, and so and so um, a lot of people who, who do these kinds of analyses you know, use those lags to, 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 to take that into account. And, and obviously it doesn't work for all species, but it might work for some of the more longer lived ones. Yeah, Mike. Uh-oh. Yeah, I don't know. It was fair for me to ask questions because I was involved in some of the work, but I will anyhow. <laughs> um, first comment on, on the question that Josie asked. Uh, yeah. You know, it's interesting because I've always been of the view that um, because there's thresholds in biomass and, and, and trophic properties that the ecosystem can never return to where it was. Um, so that, you know, so once you remove a major component, the likelihood is you'll, the system will change, it'll never come back to where it was. And so I think these results kind of support that, that kind of view. But what made it um, change so much? Well, I think it was uh, re regional, regional temperatures. We probably go through these kind of changes, I don't, in my opinion, every 10 to 30 years. Uh, we just didn't see them before because we didn't have time to. Yeah. But my question actually is more on a um, an argument that Bob have had and I have had over the inclusion of Fordville. So how am I supposed to answer it if we argue about it? So, um, because I've always been concerned including chlorophyll because actually a matter of scale yes. in terms of how that would actually translate into the presence of a mobile species and the change in abundance um, and they may only be in the system for a short time. Yeah, my answer to that is that. Oh, okay. So I'm actually on the other side on this argument, I think. And I think we can could, we could actually add some complexity to the model and actually look at the species that have been in the redundancy analysis that are most associated temporally and trophically to uh, chlorophyll production. Yes. And we could add, and, and, and I wonder if we can increase that 4% explained if we. Yes, if we and, I, and I think that that is the answer. Anchovies is the one that most closely parallels the, the chlorophyll increase. Switch. 
Uh, squid maybe too, yeah. And and, they're, and at least the anchovies are planktivores. And so it might be that an increase in, 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 in primary production gave ro rise to an increase in, in zooplankton, and then the anchovies were responding to that. Uh, yeah, oh yeah. Short comment regarding the yeah. around 91, 92 uh, shift there. There were moving up north about 500 kilometers of some oyster parasites that are known to be at the temperature, temperature in the during the same period. So clearly, a uh, climatic major climatic shift happened huh. during this period. Yeah, so there are a bunch of things that may have happened. All right, well, maybe until next semester you can think about what's going to happen 10 years from now. <laughs> well, thank you all. There is one? Oh, I got a free lunch. Out of